Welcome once again to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We're so excited that you've joined us because you're the reason we do this and we all benefit from our study. Let me introduce the 3AB and Sabbath School panel, Pastor John Dinsey. Thank you. It's a uh, blessing and opportunity to be here to share God's Word. Amen. And my sister, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. Excited to study about the covenant. And then we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I'm going to be covering the Son of Promise. Oh, sounds good. And last but not least, Ryan Day, our evangelist and singer in Israel. Amen. It's a blessing to be a part of this panel. And today we're going to be talking about Lot in Sodom. Amen. Jill, would you like to have our opening prayer? Sure. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and your spirit. And we ask, would you open up our minds and hearts right now to receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I kind of rushed through the introductions because I'm anxious to do a little recap as we begin to study Lesson 7, the covenant with Abraham. Why does the Abrahamic covenant have meaning to us as New Testament Christians? Let me read to you from Luke 1, and 73. This is Zacharias and he's prophesying when he finds out that Mary is pregnant with the with the Messiah. And he says these words, God is performing the mercy he promised to the patriarchs, remembering his holy covenant, yeah. which he swore to his father, Abraham. You see from Genesis to Revelation, it is all the unfolding of God's everlasting covenant of grace, mm -hmm. the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, James in the New Testament also refers to Abraham and he tells us what this everlasting covenant is. He's actually repeating from 2 Chronicles and Isaiah, but he says in James 2, 23, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness mm -hmm. and right. he was called the friend of God. Are you a friend of God? Abraham the Abrahamic covenant is righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's the That's only right. kind of righteousness there is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's right? So when we look at Abraham, he exercised his faith in God to obey God. He demonstrated the reality of his righteousness, his right relationship with God by walking in obedience. He was called out by God at the age of 75 and for a hundred years he lived and he died in obedience to God. So he walked with God for a hundred years. And you know what? Romans, we won't turn there, but Romans chapter four, verse 11 calls Abraham the spiritual father of all who walk in his steps of faith. How exciting. Now, let me give you a quick review. So as we come into Sunday's lesson, I want to build on this because it's interesting how God unfolds his revelation in a progressive fashion. You know, God just didn't come and blurp, here it is. He has, because we couldn't have understood it. So in Genesis 12, Abraham is 75 years old. He's childless when God calls him out of the Ur of Chaldees. And you know what's interesting? He just follows God. He has no idea where he's going, but God introduced in Genesis 12, his everlasting covenant with Abraham, mm -hmm. which would include the seed, the Messiah. It would be include land, a nation, divine blessings and protection. So, in obedient faith. Abraham believed God. He walked away from all of the comforts of the big city. He exchanged his life of leisure to become a nomad. I mean, he was an immigrant. He was a sojourner mm -hmm. who had to live in tents instead of the comfort that he was used to. But he always obeyed the commandments of God. We see in Hebrews 11:10. It says that Abraham was 
waiting. I've always said looking for the city, but it says he was waiting mm. for the city Amen. whose builder and maker was God. You know what? Abraham's a great example to us because obedience, Abraham's obedience was his pathway to blessing. And it's the same for us today. Mm. Obedience is the highest expression of worship for the Lord. And it is the pathway to God's blessing. So he comes out of the land of Canaan when he is uh, uh, with his wife, who's 10 years younger, Sarai, whose later name was Sarah. He comes out with Lot and then they, he pitched his tent. He's got this household of people with him. But as soon as he pitched his tent, he built an altar because he was devoted to worship of God and he called on the name of the Lord. And after a while, then in Genesis 12, he goes down to Egypt during the famine. But now Genesis 13, 12, God introduces the covenant. Genesis 13, he comes up from Egypt. He's Abraham and Lot, they're, oh, they're being blessed by the Lord. Their herds are so big that their herdsmen are beginning to argue who wants what. Abraham says, we've got to separate. Land can't support us together. And in total humility, he gives his younger nephew, Lot, the choice which way to go. But in Genesis 13, 14 through 16, God reaffirms. He's introduced the covenant. Now he's going to reaffirm the covenant with Abraham, promising the land. He says in uh, Genesis 13, 16, get this. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could be numbered. The name Abraham literally means exalted father. And it's interesting. He's got no descendants yet, has he? <laughs> but sure. Genesis 14, God gives Abraham the victory over the five kings. He has a meet and greet with the high priest Melchizedek. But now it takes us to Sunday. Genesis 15, the faith of Abraham. Let's look at Genesis 15, one through four. This is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless in the air of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. This was his male servant. Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now notice this, because sometimes we forget this. God didn't tell him it would come from Sarah's body right away. He said from Abram's body. So I think that explains what happens a little later on. But so he's talking about the seed, the, the seed with a capital S, which is Jesus Christ. And uh, in the plural, the seed was Abraham's posterity on the earth. So Genesis 15, five says, then he, God brought Abram outside and said, now look toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Genesis 13, he's calling him the dust of the earth. Now he's, it's a repeat and enlarge and he's saying, look at the stars. This is how your descendants will yeah. be. You know, I had this thought, don't know if it's true or not, but dust of the earth could have been his fleshly uh, heirs and the stars, the spiritual Israel. I don't know. But anyway, it was an interesting thought. Galatians 3, 7 says, those who walk in faith are the true children of Abraham. So we get to Genesis 17 and God changes Abram's name to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. And at this point, God is showing his covenant of righteousness by faith is not just for this nation of physical descendants, but 
but that Abraham will be the father of many nations. God's covenant is universal. But now we're really getting into the progressive unfolding of God's covenant. In Genesis 15, 6, it says this, mm -hmm. Abraham believed in the Lord and it accounted, it, he, God, accounted it to him for righteousness. Do you know to believe God means that we accept in obedience his plan. If you believe God, mm -hmm. you accept his plan and walk in obedience. So righteousness by faith includes obedience by grace through faith. And from the time that God introduced the covenant in to when he called him out, Abram was 75. Did you know it was 25 years mm -hmm. for the covenant son yeah. of promise to come, Isaac? Isn't that amazing? He walked so faithfully for those 25 years. But what I love about Genesis 15 is God is now, he's introduced the covenant in 13 and 14. He reaffirms the covenant. But this chapter, God is going to ratify the covenant of salvation by grace through faith, righteousness by faith. Abraham slaughters the clean animals, a heifer and a female goat and a ram, and he splits them. Then he's got the turtle dove and the pigeon. And the animals, other than the birds, were cut right in twain. They were just right down the middle. And listen to what Genesis 15, 12 says. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. God put him in a deep sleep. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then verse 17 says, It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. This burning oven, mm -hmm. this I mean, the smoking oven and the burning torch were symbols of God's divine presence. And I want you to notice, this was a, when they cut a covenant is what it was called back in the day. Typically, both parties would pass through the middle, but please notice this. At the ratification of God's covenant of salvation by grace through faith, only God passes between the covenant sacrifices because the covenant is built only on God's promises, not upon ours. Romans 4, 3 through 4 says God's plan of redemption mm -hmm. has always been salvation by grace through faith. We've got to trust in him. And Romans 4, 19 says that although Abraham was a hundred years old, he did not waver in faith. He did not consider the deadness of his own body or Sarah's womb, but he just was fully convinced of God's promise mm -hmm. and he, God accounted it to him as righteousness. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, we now move to Monday's portion of the lesson. My name is John Dinsey and the title for Monday's lesson is Abraham's Doubts. Abraham's Doubts. We now move to Genesis chapter 16 and beginning in verse 1. Let's take a look at it. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. I want to pause here because uh, the Lord changed Abraham's name, a Abram's name to Abraham. And mm -hmm. as you have already heard, means father of many nations, which is interesting because many years passed uh, after God made the promise that he would have children. And time passes, people begin to doubt, is God going yeah. to do this or not? And I can see Abraham, uh, what is your name? So-and-so, and your name, Abraham, which means father of many nations. Oh, and how many children do you have? <laughs> um, none. It began to be a, a, a very difficult situation, and it, I'm sure it played on Abraham's mind. Mm -hmm. So when we get to Genesis chapter 16, and we see here that uh, something is presented to us for the, uh, verse two. It says, so Sarai said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. 
And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. So we see here that um, neither one of them uh, tried to encourage one another at this point. They, I'm sure they prayed many, many, many times, many years. Lord, is it now? Please bring this promise. Abraham was advancing in age. He is concerned who's going to inherit the things that I have. And so in this, uh, let's call it desperation, they resorted to what Sarai suggested, which was really a common practice of the day. The neighbors around wouldn't say, oh, look what Abraham did. No, it was a common practice of the day. So this was a serious problem because mm -hmm. you see, when God promises something, we can see throughout the Bible that he fulfills his promise. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And if we try to do God's job, <laughs> we get into serious trouble. This, right. uh, this was a great, great mistake, which uh, even to this day, you can see uh, there are issues between Abraham's children. So notice here that the word please was used and you have in the, uh, in the King James Version, I pray thee. You know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expression of a request is such as in a pleading. Mm -hmm. And Abraham consented, you know, we, well, Sarah appears, uh, the time for her to have children is gone. Mm -hmm. well, that, this must be the best solution. Maybe this is the way God is going to work uh, to fulfill his promise. And you know, we as human beings, sometimes um, we try to reason things mm -hmm. that uh, we know are wrong and we say, well, maybe, you know, this is acceptable to the Lord. And so they went ahead and did this thing. Uh, let's go now to verse three. Yeah, Genesis 16, three. Then Sarai's Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram. Notice this, it says to be his wife. Mm. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, many years had passed. Mm -hmm. And it says, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived her mistress, that is Sarai, became despised in her eyes. Mm -hmm. So we see here that a situation begins to boil in which now Hagar is looking at Sarai. <laughs> I have children and you don't. I, 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 her, her, in her mind, her position began to be higher. Mm. I am the wife of the man that has all of this. I am the one that is bringing him children. And she heard, she knew about the promise of the Lord. And so she begins to look at Sarai as beneath her. And it says, the, the Bible uses a strong language, despised mm. in her eyes. So, uh, Immediate action had to be taken. A situation was uh, created that brought problems mm -hmm. to the family. A great challenge. Uh, you know, today, you know, we look at, at this situation and uh, we go, wow, how could, how could Abraham and Sarah do that? Mm -hmm. There's a practice today that people use when couples have trouble having children. They call it artificial what? Insemination. Insemination. So this is still practiced today. It or is not as, hmm? or, or surrogate, surrogate mothers, yes. Mm -hmm. So we see that today there's something similar. It, it, back in those days, they didn't have, or they didn't use the type of uh, system we have today. Let's go to uh, Genesis 16, verse five. Then Sarah said to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. Now there's blame going back and forth. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abraham said to Sarai, uh, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. You see, although Hagar had become Abraham's wife, she was still considered in position to be Sarai's handmaid. And it was a difficult situation for Abraham that he's now facing. You know, he's mm -hmm. got this hope and this child being born. And now the, the two wives are having issues. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult situation. What do you do? Well, Sarai is the love of his life. Do with her mm -hmm. as you please. 
And uh, this is one of those difficult times. And this is what happened, of course. Uh, Hagar flees. And now let's go quickly into verse 7 uh, of Genesis chapter 16. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. I'm sure everybody knows where that is, mm. but <laughs> it's mentioned in the lessons. Now the lesson brings out something interesting and I'd like to read it to you. It says the reference to the angel of the Lord, Genesis 16, 7, is a title that is often identified with the Lord Jehovah. Mm. See Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 and verse 13 and 22. So when you see the angel of the Lord, it is a reference, uh, we would like to tell you, of Christ himself. Verse eight, and he said, Hagar, notice what he says. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's ma maid, where have you come from? Where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Mm. The angel of the Lord was telling her, recognize your position, mm -hmm. return and submit. Uh, uh, in other words, change your attitude. Change your attitude and things will go better for you. And so uh, this is the angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord now gives her a wonderful promise. Notice verse 10, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they will not be, so that sh they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. Hmm. And this is a wonderful uh, declaration because uh, Hagar now hears, I'm going to have a son. And through him, Abraham can continue to have descendants. And this, this was encouraging to her. Now notice verse uh, 12, he shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And this is happening Today, you can go to Israel and you can see the sons of Ishmael dwelling in the presence of his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the, you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. Now, all of this is uh, something that helps us understand that this, uh, it, when you go to uh, Galatians chapter 4, you will see that this is a, an allegory. And it's, mm -hmm. I, I like to read this quickly to you. Uh, Galatians 4, uh, 23 to 26. But he who was the, of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was a by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this is Agar in Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is ab above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Well, my time is up. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. That was wonderful. We're going to take a quick break and be right back. Don't, don't go away. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we're going to go to Jill Morricone, who has Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Shelley and Pastor Johnny. What an incredible lesson, The Covenant with Abraham, which is, I think, one of my favorite lessons. Uh, I have Genesis chapter 17, as Shelley already mentioned. I'm Jill Morricone. And my lesson on Tuesday is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, which, of course, we know to be circumcision. And we will get to that. Pastor Johnny just ended with the end of chapter 16. And what does it say? Abram was 86 years old. We pick up chapter 17 when Abram was, what's that? 
99 Nine. years oh. old. Wow. So 13 years have passed between Genesis chapter 16 and the start of Genesis chapter 17. Ishmael is now 13 years old. The child conceived out of works, as you brought out, Pastor Johnny. The child conceived out of lack of faith, out of presumption, mm -hmm. out of trying to play God. Have you ever played God? Wow. Trying to get God to answer your prayers. We see the discord and strife that existed in that household. And it's also interesting, I don't want to make too much of this, but we see in Genesis 15, as Shelley had talked about, this God appearing to Abraham and the covenant being given and made with the separation of the animals. And then in Genesis chapter 16, God never speaks to Abram. And Abram never speaks to God. In fact, uh, God comes and speaks to Hagar, but we see almost this kind of separation going on. And then we come to Genesis 17 and the covenant is reiterated. The covenant is renewed. Genesis 17 verse one, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. I am El Shaddai. It's the first time that that reference to God uh, is used. That name of God is mm -hmm. used in the Bible. I am El Shaddai. I am the God for whom nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. Walk before me and be blameless. The second covenant making story is again introduced by a theophany, which is just an appearance with God. So it appeared as if God was a little absent. Of course, he was not absent, but it, it appeared he was absent from Abram there in Genesis 16. But God shows up again to Abram in Genesis chapter 17. You know, the first takeaway I get from that, Almighty God, mm. El Shaddai condescends to the weakness of humanity. Mm. He knows our frame. He knows we are but dust. Was Abram perfect? Absolutely not. He had taken some matters into his own hands. He had sought to help God out. And yet the infinite stoops to the finite. The almighty God to frail humanity. Spotless perfection to the mistakes of a man. I love our God. He condescends to us. Mm -hmm. Verse two, Genesis 17, verse two, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Takeaway number two, only God can do the impossible. It seemed like it was impossible. For Sarai, it was past the time of bearing for women. So she couldn't have kids, let's just be honest. She was done, she couldn't have kids. And yet only God can do the impossible. And God's saying, I'm about ready, Abram, to do the impossible for you and your wife. Jeremiah 32, 27, I love that. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Are you going through an impossible situation? Know that your God can do the impossible for you too. Yeah. Takeaway number three, the covenant is based on our faith in God's faithfulness to work in us. I love that. It's all about faith in God's faithfulness to fulfill his covenant promises in us. Let's read the next verse, verses three through five. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Now his name's changed. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I love what Pastor Johnny said. And people said, and what's your name? My name's Abraham. Oh, really? How many children do you have? Mm. Well, at that point, he had one who was Ishmael, right? Only one. Romans 4, 17. This is in reference to this passage. It says, what? God who calls those things that are not as though they already were. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number four, faith accepts as reality what our feelings or our finite minds cannot understand. Mm -hmm. I want to say that again. Faith accepts as reality what our feelings cannot understand. Mm -hmm. So you might not feel forgiven, but God says you're forgiven. That means, guess what? You are forgiven. You might not feel justified, but God says you are justified. God says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. God says you are holy and blameless. Accept what God's word says about you. Accept that by faith. Verse six, 
Genesis 17, verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. Takeaway number five, God's the one who brings fruitfulness. God's the one who causes growth. God's the one who gives power. Moving very quickly because we got to get to the sign. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. We compare this with Genesis 3.15, that promise of the seed, the covenant of redemption. We see this here with the everlasting covenant of grace that God made this covenant of salvation. Takeaway number six. God's everlasting covenant of grace is for all people, for all time. Mm -hmm. It's to bring his people into a saving relationship with him. Now let's look at the sign that is circumcision. We're going to read verses 10 and 11 for that. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it should be a sign of the covenant between me and you. There were stipulations for this. The male children were to be circumcised on the eighth day. Every male child was to be circumcised, those by birth and those by purchase. And the uncircumcised would be considered cut off from the camp or cut off from God's covenant. Takeaway number one, circumcision is meaningless without righteousness by faith. Amen. There's a whole discussion in the New Testament church. Uh, we don't really have time to get to it, but look at Romans 4. We'll look at one verse, Romans 4 verse 11. There was this discussion, did Christians have to be circumcised in order to be justified, in order to be saved? Was circumcision necessary for salvation? And we see in Romans 4 verse 11, Paul says, he, that's Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was still uncircumcised, mm. that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. You see, Abraham was justified as Shelley already read Genesis 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted or imputed to him for righteousness. And that was clearly prior to circumcision because we just see circumcision introduced here in Genesis chapter 17. So Abraham was justified, made righteous before God by believing God. Takeaway number two, circumcision is an external sign of an internal work. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. So circumcision was an external sign, yes, but it was a sign of an internal change, something that God was doing in the hearts and minds of his covenant people. The final takeaway, number three. Circumcision represents that we cannot do anything by our own flesh. Mm -hmm. I want to read a quote here from Kent Hughes. It says, circumcision involved Abraham's powers of procreation, the area of life in which he had resorted to fleshly expediency, and he had failed. He had tried to do it in his own physical nature, and he had failed. Man's best plans and strength of will would never bring about the promise. For Abraham, circumcision was an act of repentance and a sign of dependence upon God for the promise. You see, circumcision would always represent to Abraham. I had never really processed that before. It would represent the failure of dependency on his mm, own flesh. Mm. He tried to secure a seed through his own works, through what he thought he could do, instead of trusting in God. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 3, verse 3. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, mm. rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence, what's that word? In, in the, the flesh. flesh. So circumcision represents that we cannot do it of our own strength. So in Genesis 17, we see the covenant reiterated and circumcision given as a sign that God will justify us by faith. Amen. Amen. Boy, that's Amen. great. Thank Excellent. you, Jill. Well, moving right along, we are moving into Genesis chapter 18. 
So we're looking at uh, this son of promise that comes in Genesis chapter 18. Finally, the Lord is going to visit Abraham. It says here in, in chapter 18, by the way, my name is James Rafferty and I have Wednesday's lesson. Chapter 18, verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. That is, Abraham sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, verse 2, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, we've got to take into consideration here that Abraham is 99 years old mm -hmm. at this point. But we've also got to remember that Abraham lived to be 175. So he was probably, in our accounting, he was probably in his 40s, mid-40s <laughs> somewhere. So he runs to meet these three strangers. He bows himself before them. One of them is the Lord because it says in verse 3, And he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. The lesson brings out that this word, my Lord, is Adonai, mm. uh, a title often used for God, mm. as in Genesis 20, verse 4, Exodus 15, verse 7. So he rushes around to take care of these guests. He says, verse 4, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch, verse 5, a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore you are coming to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. I think that Paul references this in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Don't be forgetful to entertain strangers for mm. some have entertained angels right. unawares, right? And so Abraham considers the strangers to be welcome under his tents. And he rushes around at 99 years of age, mid 40s for us, <laughs> to prepare a meal for them, right? And so at verse six, Abraham hastens unto the tent unto Sarah and he said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran to the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, verse eight, and he set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did Eat. And this is, a, is, a, is an amazing picture. Abraham not only prepares all of this food, but Abraham stands by. If you've ever been to a very posh, a very nice restaurant, um, we did this. It was in the Philippines at the time. And in the Philippines, you can actually get a pretty good meal, at least back then when we were there, you could actually get a pretty good posh uh, environment and meal for, you know, a lot less than you'd have to pay for it here. And when we were in this restaurant, this very nice restaurant, we had waiters standing between each one of our chairs wow. every, with a napkin folded over, ready to wait on us, to put our plates down, to take our plates away. They didn't move, you know, like waiters in our, our normal restaurants, they, you see them maybe 50, 15 or 20 minutes between times. But these waiters were right there, just standing there. You can, this is the picture that we have of Abraham. He is standing there with these strangers and he is ready to wait on them. He is ready to assist them, ready to help them, ready to serve them. This is the picture that we have. I love this picture because it's, it's, we'll get to the point here in a second. So it says that in verse 10, and he said unto him, where, or the stranger said unto him, he stood by them that eat, and they said unto him, where is Sarai thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent, verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. Now, Sarah heard this. Sarah was wondering who these men were. You can imagine her curiosity is, is engaged here. And she's wondering, who are these men that are, that are gathering there with my husband that he's been so in, you know, excited about taking care of? And she's listening at the door. You know how you're curious and you're wondering who this person is that your husband's talking to on the phone. He's so excited. And, he's, and so you're listening and you're listening. And so she hears this. And she hears these men talk about her having a son. And when she heard this in the tent door, which was behind him, verse uh, 11, now Abraham and Sarah were very old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of the women. Therefore, Sarah laughed. <laughs> Had to put that verse in there, verse 11 in there, to explain why it is that Sarah 
laughed in verse 12. So you have to, you know, Sarah didn't just laugh out of nothing. It wasn't just out of emptiness. Sarah was focusing on her age. She was focusing on her flesh. She was focusing yeah. on herself. But not just her age. She was focusing on Abraham's age, right? She's looking at Abraham's age. She's looking at her age. She's listening to Adonai, the Lord. She's listening to the Lord and the, and the angels. She's listening to the Lord make this promise and she's thinking about herself and she can't help but laugh. <laughs> and how many times do we do that? We'll get to that point in just a second. Good. So she laughs, but then here's what happens. Abraham, uh, Sarah laughs within herself saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, also being old? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Sarah is still not in the scene. She's back in the tent somewhere. The Lord said unto Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I of a surety bear a child, which am of old? Whew. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I really like that, Jill. Is there anything too yes. hard for the Lord? You know that verse in Jeremiah? At the time appointed, I will return according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And here's the last verse we're going to look at. And Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou did laugh. Mm. <laughs> so here we have uh, the whole package, if you will. The whole package is here. The whole package of salvation is, is contained in this little story in Genesis chapter 18. The son of promise mm. is given here in contrast with Ishmael mm. and the failure of humanity. It's when we fail, it's when we fall flat on our face that God comes to us Amen. with his promises. Yeah. It's, it's when we fail that we feel like giving up, that we feel overwhelmed with guilt, that we feel like, you know, there's no hope for me. That's when God steps in. And friends, you may feel like you fail God and you've fallen from God and there's no hope for you and you've backslidden and you just feel, feel like you've just yeah. messed everything up. Yeah. And that's the time when God will step into your Thank life you. with His promises. Mm -hmm. Your promises are like ropes of sand, but His promises. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? There's nothing in your life, there's nothing in who you are, there's nothing in your failures that's too hard for the Lord to mend, to fix, to reconcile, to save. That's the message that we find here in Genesis chapter 18. But it's bigger than that. You know, the 18th chapter of, of Genesis has this entire package. It has the keys that are essential to pr practical Christianity because it pictures Christ, the son of promise. You're going to have a child. Well, this child was the beginning of the seed that was to point to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It was salvation by faith that Adonai, that the Lord was sharing with Abraham here. It was salvation by faith in contrast to our unbelief and our failure. It was the final end of those who, re who, who put their trust in themselves and now transitioned to putting their trust in the Lord. And by the way, this message came just before the Lord was on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. So you have the final end of the wicked also, the final end of those who reject Christ uh, that's going to be touched on here as we go on. I don't have that part of the lesson. So the son of promise points to Jesus Christ, who is a type uh, Isaac was a type of. Then we have this picture of our unbelief. You know, Sarah's laughing and uh, she's laughing at the promises of God. How many times do we laugh when we think about uh, you know, what God really wants for us. And we just say, you know, it's, that's just, <laughs> that just can't happen. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have this next stage where Sarah actually justifies her laughing. She justifies, or let me put it this way, she tries to justify that she didn't laugh. She tries to justify herself mm -hmm. and say, hey, no, 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 I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I do believe in God. How many times do we say we believe in God but we don't actually believe in God. Mm. We're, 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 we're actually laughing at God, but then we're saying, no, 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 I, didn't, I wasn't laughing at God. I do, I do believe in God. Really, I do believe in God, but I wasn't laughing at God. But inside we are. Right. Inside we really do have that unbelief. Inside we really are not trusting fully in the promises mm -hmm. of God. And then it goes on here, and it includes this um, picture, I think it's the most important picture, of hospitality. I mean, that's where it all starts. The hospitality that Abraham has to these three strangers. When you look in Matthew chapter 25 and you look at the final judgment that comes upon 
uh, those who believe in God and those who don't. Mm -hmm. It all boils down to this spirit of hospitality. I think it's the greatest test. I know for, for many of us, you know, being hospitable to strangers, uh, you know, helping people who maybe you don't even know who need our help. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25, uh, verses 34 and onward. The king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, my, ye, my blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me meat, and I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous shall say unto him, When did we do this? When did we, we feed you and give you water to drink and took you in and, and, and clothed you and, and, and visited you in prison and came when you were sick? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Whenever you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Thank Amen. you guys so much. As always, on Thursday's lesson, I get to learn so much and glean from everyone before me. I'm Ryan Day, and I have Thursday's lesson entitled Lot in Sodom. Uh, do a little bit of background here because I don't think we've sufficiently talked about who Lot is. Lot is the nephew to Abraham. And so if you go back to, we're not going to go, we're not going to read this, but if you go back to the 13th and 14th chapters of Genesis, you'll see that Lot had separated from Abraham at this point. Uh, he had taken his family to Sodom, to the city of Sodom, which the Bible makes it very clear it was a very wicked city. Now, when he separated from Abraham, instead of going into a direction or into a land where he could inhabit himself and start his own, you know, his own life, his own house, maybe out in the plains, maybe out, you know, a separate from the big cities, he goes into the big city, the wicked city of Sodom. And so you know that there's nothing good that's going to come of this. And sure enough, uh, you know, not once but twice now we find Lot get in trouble and he has to be saved not once but twice, you know, once, you know, he's taken captive from Sodom and then Abraham has to go save him. And now uh, the Lord, okay, Jill referred to this earlier as a, as a theophany. This is no doubt, you can even go as far to call it a Christophany. This is Jesus Christ, I believe, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ in the flesh who has come to visit Abraham. And now uh, he has gotten up, this, these three gentlemen have gotten up and now they're, they're, they're going to make their way. They're leaving Abraham's presence. But before this happens, now the two men, which were no doubt angels, they go on to Sodom, but the Lord lingers back for a moment to speak with Abraham. And in the latter verses of, of, uh, of uh, Genesis chapter 18, we hear that we have this, we have this interesting conversation between Abraham and the Lord mm -hmm. in which the Lord makes it known to him what's about to happen. Let's read Genesis chapter 18 verses 20 through 21. I wish I could read all these verses, but we simply don't have enough time. But let's at least read verses 20 and 21. It says, and the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because there is sin, uh, because their sin is very grave, I will go down and notice this now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, my friends, take this in. I love these stories in Genesis because this, my mind immediately goes to Luke chapter 24 where Jesus is having this encounter with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He gives them this incredible Bible study and it says, starting with Moses and the prophets, he basically reveals to him through the scripture the, the things pertaining to himself. Speaking of Christ, he's showing himself through the scriptures. And I believe when we get into the book of Genesis, many people think, oh, it's Genesis. It's the beginning. It's the origins. We can't see Christ in, in the scriptures. Christ is flooded in imagery mm -hmm. and foreshadowing all through this book. And not just Jesus, but also I believe in these passages that we're reading here, the stories of Abraham and Isaac and mm -hmm. Jacob and Joseph and all of these powerful stories, there is beautiful beautiful foreshadowing mm -hmm. and imagery that even points forward to the future prophetically to what the church is going to have to go through in the last days. And what we're about to study in the little time, pray for that clock because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, in the little time that we have, I want to show you the, the interesting thing that Lot and his family are going through with this destruction of Sodom is very similar to what we also are going through here in the last days and what we will have to go through in okay. the decision making that needs to be made before the destruction of this world. So interestingly enough, what's happening here. Notice how Jesus says to Abraham, look, Abraham, I'm going to make known to you what I'm about to do. Remember the, the angels, the two angels that came in, they've already made their way. Mm -hmm. They've already made their, they've, they've walked away at this point. They're on their way to Sodom. Jesus lingers back and says, look, what's about to happen is I'm about to go down and see Sodom. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's about to go down and investigate. Mm. <laughs> There's an investigative judgment 
about Sodom, towards Sodom, before this destruction happens. In other words, God's going to go down and he's going to review. He's going to see what's happening, what the city's about. He's going to investigate to see. And of course, Abraham, when he finds out exactly what's about to happen, now he begins to plead with God. Oh, Lord, but what about all the righteous in this city? If there's 50 righteous people, will you save the city? God, of course, in all of his grace and mercy, of course, Abraham, if I can find 50 righteous people, I'll spare the city. What about 45? If there's 45, I'll save the city. What about 30? What about 20? And he goes all the way down to 10. Lord, if you find 10 people that's righteous in this city, will you spare it? Look, I'll spare it. I'll spare it if I can find 10 righteous. Mm. And so now he goes on to the city. Now we pick it up in verse 1 of, of Genesis chapter 19. It says, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. So now they've, they've arrived to, to Sodom. And Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, please uh, t please turn into the, your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go your way. Then they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered the house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Now, again, I'm not going to have enough time to read all these verses, but what's about to happen between verses 4 and verse 8 is the wicked men of Sodom find out that there's two new guests mm. in Lot's house. And they come out and you know, they start beating on the door and say, hey, them two men in there, let them come out so that we may have our way with them. Mm. This is a wicked city, okay? They're wanting to have a sexually immoral acts with these two men. And Lot comes out and pleads with these men. And here's what's interesting, just to make this point spiritually here. You can tell that Lot, excuse me, Lot has become very desensitized to the sin of Sodom, mm. but just based on his reaction to this scenario, mm. he, he says to these wicked men, oh, but, but guys, no, 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 leave my guests alone, but I have two daughters who have not been with men at all. I'll let you have them and you can do what you wish to them. Mm. Mm. Seriously? It's like, what? I mean, this is a messed up story. We can read this and go, this is a messed up story. Mm. Uh, my friends, this, is, this goes to show you when you give just a little bit, when you walk away from plan, it wasn't God's plan for him to be in Sodom, but when you walk away from God and you begin over a period of time to become desensitized, mm -hmm. your judgment begins to leave you. You don't, you don't practice good judgment. Lot's not practicing good judgment. Over my dead body are you getting my daughters? That's what I would say. Uh, but in this case, he's like, ah, you know, just take my daughters. You can see where, where Lot's mind is. Mm. But here's what's interesting. You continue reading through the story. Now the angels have a good sense. These two, in, these two angels have a good sense. This city is wicked, beyond wicked. And here's what's interesting. <laughs> get this. They don't have, notice Lot and his family get not one, not two, but three angels warnings mm. before. Mm. First, first angels warnings. Get this. Let's go to verse 12. Verse 12. That's good. That's interesting. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because of the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So here's the first warning. Get out. Get out of the city because I'm about to destroy it. Oh and notice Lot goes and he speaks with his son-in-law uh, who had married his daughters. And I'm guessing these were different daughters. Uh, and he says to him, get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But his sons-in-law seemed, notice, it seemed he was joking. Mm -hmm. This goes even further to show you that he's, he's destroyed, that his desensitizing process mm -hmm. living in the city has made Lot more into a carnal person. His, his witness has been destroyed so much that when he finally comes with a real salvational message, to his own family, his family laughs at him. Brother, you got to be you, seriously. Are you joking? They don't even take him serious because they haven't even seen Lot living according to the way he's supposed to be living. So he's become completely desensitized to sin. Here comes the second angel's warning. Verse 15, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of this city. But notice verse 16, and while he lingered, mm. Mm. Second angel's warning, mm -hmm. you know, and this was us. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Mm -hmm. Get out, right? It's interesting here. While he lingered, mm -hmm. the love of the world, in this case, the thorns and the, the love that he had for this city and the life that he had built, he had become spiritually bind mm -hmm. to, this, to his situation, his situation, his spirituality, and what is happening in the city, that he's lingered because his heart is there. And we're going to see his wife's heart was even more there, right? Mm -hmm. 
And here comes the third angel's warning. You know what is interesting? So much that he, he, he lingered so much that the angels had to force him out. For in the next part of the verse, it says, And the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord, being merciful to him, they brought him out of the city and set him outside of the city. So it came to pass when they brought them outside and he said, Escape for your life. Here's the third angel's warning. Escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. You know what he said? Get out of the city cities and go to the mountains. Mm. Mm-hmm. Have we heard that before? Mm-hmm. Get out of the cities and go to the mountains. Mm-hmm. Get out of the cities, go to the mountains. And so now they're leaving. And of course, you know, uh, you could see again, they're so desensitized that mm-hmm. his wife, again, does not keep and honor the, the message that is given to him. She turns around, becomes a pillar of salt. My friends, uh, you know, there, there's so much here that I could say. Uh, there's so much I want to say. Uh, but, you know, we have to make sure that even and the spiritual application I want to apply to this is today we have a message. Get Come out of her, my people. Is your heart in Sodom? Mm. Are you professing God, but your heart's in Sodom? Are you professing God? Have you, have you left Babylon, but yet your heart's still in Babylon? Mm. These are lessons to be learned. So much more that I wish I could have talked about here. But in this case, we want to praise God that in these last days, we also have angels' warnings to get us out from where we are so that we may turn our hearts to God and live. Amen. Amen. Boy, that's yeah. good teaching, mm-hmm. I'll tell you. Let's just take a quick second and have a recap thought. You know, when you look at Abraham's life, you see that he had times when he failed the test of faith, but he <laughs> continued to persevere and he was faithful. I'm reading to, to you from Revelation 2.10, just the first part and the last part. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. This was Abraham and it can be for you if you are faithful. Amen. The covenant given to Abraham is extended to us. The promises given to Abraham are extended to us. Galatians 3, 29. If we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. Hospitality. Uh, it's not just a manifestation of goodness and, and kindness toward others. It's a manifestation of the character of Christ who will serve us at that great supper table in the new heavens and the new earth, who served his disciples at the last supper. To be hospitable is to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the last days, we were told that there's a harlot and she has wine. She's making the world drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication and intoxicated the world. Well, you know, what's interesting in the aftermath of Sodom, Lot also had some women who gave him wine. He became drunk. And of course, out of that came the enemies of God, the Moabites and many of the other enemies from his own daughters. He lost his family. My friends, give your heart to Jesus today and turn to him while you can. Amen. Amen. Ron, Amen. thank you so much. And James and Jill and John, what a blessed study. We always learn so much from each other. Mm-hmm. Please join us next week when we do lesson eight, The Promise. And right now our prayer for you is that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you always. Amen.